BBC One, your chance to help maintain law and order in Crime Watch UK. First of all, many thanks to everyone who called last month. Many of our investigations are now looking a good deal more promising as a result. In particular, because of information from viewers, a man has been arrested and charged with 14 serious sexual offences against children, teenagers and adults in the Greater Manchester area. The attacks were becoming increasingly frequent and police have asked us to pass on their appreciation for your help. There has been other progress too, but more on that after the first of this month's reconstructions. Three weeks ago, a businesswoman, Jean Bradley, was murdered beside her car in a suburb of West London. The tragedy made front page headlines because it seemed so similar to another notorious and unsolved murder that happened two years earlier. The victim then was Penny Bell. In fact, detectives are reasonably confident there's no link whatsoever. But they do think Crime Watch viewers may be able to solve Jean Bradley's murder. And you're about to hear from three crucial witnesses and see for the first time a portrait of the killer. Jean Bradley well, lived in Crowthorne, Berkshire, lovely. with the teacher, Nicholas Osborne. Yes, sunny. I last spoke yes, to Jean nice on the lovely, Sunday yes. before she was killed. Uh, I was in Rome with the school trip. What did the forum look like? So she particularly asked me to uh, check Rome out thoroughly because a week after I was due back, uh, both of us were off to holiday uh, in Rome uh, during Easter week, it was going to be. Um, and she was actually very much looking forward to that. Jean specialised in helping companies move premises. Her own office was in New Bond Street, 30 miles from her home. When she moved to her new job in London, uh, we had some trouble working out the best way to commute in. Acton Town Station is just around the corner. But she found that the best way was to drive halfway in and then take the fast tube line from Acton. Yes, couldn't be more convenient, could it? Seems a nice, respectable road. Mm. Think the car would be safe here? Jean was very keen to keep her car immaculate, and certainly the reason why we checked out the roads in which she parked her car was for the safety of the car. Uh, we had no idea, no views on sort of her own personal safety. It just simply wasn't that sort of area. Jean had left work and travelled home on the Piccadilly line from Green Park Station. She arrived at Acton Town at about 7.20. Also driving home just then was a local carpenter. Jean had stopped off en route to buy a couple of cans of drink. Another commuter remembers passing her in Gunnersbury Gardens and she recalls that no one else was in the street. Jean had parked her BMW in Carberry Avenue, just off Gunnersbury Gardens. It had been there since 7.30 that morning. As I was driving down Carberry Avenue, I seen a man and a woman tugging at each other on the pavement. I see it was pretty serious as the man was holding the woman down and kind of like standing all over her. You kill him! A woman and her son passing in a Ford Escort were able to follow the attacker. I said to my son, oh, he looks as though he's done something. Come on, we'll follow him and see where he's going. He's quite a tall man and, and taking long strides, but he wasn't actually running away in, in any great hurry. He looked really odd because he had um, a silly hat on that looked a bit like a sou'wester. It's not the type of hat that you would wear around this part of the world. I was halfway down Gunsbury Gardens when I was aware of this white van rushing up behind me and I sensed that he was in a great hurry to overturn. I think you better go and ring the police. All right, miss. You do it. 
just attack the woman back there. Do you want to try it on with me now? Come on. The man was very pale. On, His cheeks were very drawn in, and uh, he had a darkish stubble, possibly two days' growth. He was very cold. He could stare right through you. As he came towards me, he raised his hand, which he had a black bag wrapped. I didn't know what he had in it. It seemed pretty rigid. The two men ran off into Gunnersbury Lane, just off the North Circular Road. The woman in the Ford Escort was able to get ahead of them. I had a very good look at the tall man as he was approaching me to cross the road. He was a good six foot to six foot three. The van driver was a pace or two behind him. That man there, he's after attacking a woman. Call the police. At this point, I decided it was best to go home and make sure that my son had called the police, and I just watched them head off towards Acton Town Station. Police badly need to trace everyone who saw this chase, including people the carpenter called upon to help. This white golf convertible came down on the road. He was a Rastafarian, and I was asking him to give me a hand. Can you give me a hand? He's got a white coat and a black hat. Can you give me? Oh, forget it, brother. The chase had now been going on for nearly a mile. I think the time went he lost me. I hid behind a tree and hid behind a car and things like that, the way he wouldn't think I was following him. He didn't look back very often. The attacker went into South Acton Estate. It was nearly quarter to eight and several more witnesses now must have seen him. Police need all these people to come forward. Attempts to revive Jean failed. She died of multiple stab wounds from an eight-inch blade. At the edge of the estate, the carpenter almost caught up with her killer. He looked back and saw me, and he started to run again. I thought all along that he wasn't a very fit man, because when he came to the end of the estate, there was a railing, and normally if you're a fit person, you'd, you'd jump it. But uh, he didn't jump it. I went to run across the road, and this car came around, possibly a flying pole. I hesitated because it was a bit close and didn't slow down, I ran. He ran right around the corner. When I got down to the corner, regularly close, I could not see the man anymore. But unknown to the carpenter, one man had a clear view of the killer's next move. The man I saw was definitely on edge because he was moving backwards and forwards in the doorway. He had a cream three-quarter length parka, jet black hair, black trousers. They were short because they were flapping above his ankles. He was definitely flat-footed. He was looking around him and trying to figure out which way would be the best way to get out of the estate. He was carrying a black bag in his right hand. He had a very, very tight grip on it and he never let go of it once. I started to realise that there was something wrong and by that time the tall man had gone. The attacker was last seen walking up Buckland Walk, a mile and a half from where Jean Bradley had been stabbed. Bob Fenton, where did he go from Buckland Walk, do you know? Well, he was heading towards Acton High Street, um, but I'm not only appealing for people in that uh, general area, because he could have deviated off the route, I'm also appealing still for people who actually saw the carpenter chasing the man. That's from Carberry Avenue, past Acton Town Tube Station, and through the South Acton Estate. And we ought to make it clear, many of them wouldn't, or most of them, wouldn't have had any idea what had happened. They wouldn't have realised why he was chasing him. No, they wouldn't, but they would, if they were there, they would have probably noticed something going on. What was this guy's motive? Have you any idea at all? There's no apparent motive whatsoever. Um, there is nothing stolen. He's certainly a strange character, and he's probably this, this man come to the notice of the national uh, agencies for helping people, such as social services, psychiatric, drink, drugs, and maybe even he's bought his clothes in char charity shops. That's the sort of thing we believe he's possibly doing. So anybody who's a nurse or works in a rehabilitation unit or anything like that, not necessarily in this area, you really want to, them yes, to rack their brains, do yes, they know him? Yes, we're seeking help for anybody. He, he's a sort of tall, thin, rather ungainly sort of fellow. What else do you know about him? He's, he is, he's a very, very, very gaunt man, um, and, and that sticks out 
most particular. Doesn't even look after himself very well. He, a bit he, of a great he, beard. And yes, he had about a two days growth of stubble. He's well described on the programme. And this hat he was wearing, this is a, this is a fairly sort of similar sou'wester type of thing. Very weird because it was a dry night, very cold but dry. Yes, it is a strange. Everyone's commented on this hat in particular. And obviously we would appeal to anyone that knows someone that fits a general description and has or even wears a similar hat. Now what's just emerged today, I think, is, is a cru what could be a crucial clue, a fragment of, of plastic that you recovered from the murder scene. Now, describe why this is important. This bit that we're seeing here is the recovered fragment. It's what, about eight inches, eight, nine inches across, 21 centimeters or so. Yes, that's, that's foreign to the scene. It's, it doesn't come from the victim or anybody that attended the scene, so we can only assume it comes from the attacker. Um, it's possible that this is part of a bag that was wrapped around the weapon, the knife that was used, and perhaps Gene, the victim, actually ripped and snatched it at the time of the attack. Very distinctive, this sort of logo on it. And also, if it was your boutique this bag was part of, or your shop, or if you printed or made this bag, maybe you'll recognize this S. All the writing, the printing, that's very small on there. Uh, as you can see, this shows uh, where it was made and printed in the United, uh, something or other, United Arab Emirates, United States, United Kingdom, or something like that. And a potential new witness that you're now trying to trace. Yes, we now know that around the time the murder happened, there was a street vendor knocking door to door in Carberry Avenue. Um, he's described as a 20 year old. We don't think he's involved in any way whatsoever. I'm interested to speak to him because he could have seen this man loitering around. Clearly he was in the street for some time. I've got to point out, I'm not interested in prosecuting for any offences out of his uh, trading from door to door. I simply want his information if he has any. Okay, this is three weeks ago tonight. Incidentally, there's a very substantial reward of £20,000. Also, if you live in the South Acton estate, there's a mobile uh, police station on the estate. It's near the Prince of Wales pub at the corner of Church Road and Ragley Close, and it's open until 1 o'clock tonight. The lines here are open until uh, at least midnight on 081 811 h 081 811 8181 If you think you recognise this man or can tell us anything about it, if you want to call the murder inquiry room direct, the number there is 0895 254 Please ask for the incident room at Rice Slip on 0895 254 well, now to photo call. Last month, several leads came in on Peter Reynolds, which are now being followed up. Inquiries are continuing on two other cases, and six viewers identified this man, who was arrested as a result and is now out on bail. Once again, Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames are here to take us through this month's faces. If you live in southeast London, you might have come across this man. Over the past five months, he's committed a series of robberies at petrol stations, and on some occasions, he's seriously assaulted the cashier. We'd like to speak to him in connection with about 20 similar offences. He's in his 20s and around 5 foot 8. If you know where he is, please call. This is Brian Bernard O'Neill, and officers in Leeds believe he may have information about a series of car frauds. Yorkshire Motor Services started business about a year ago in New York Road, Leeds. They advertised in newspapers and magazines offering to buy cars. The firm then agreed to take on and settle any outstanding higher purchase payments, but the company is now the subject of an inquiry. Brian O'Neill is 25, 5 foot 10 and slim with short fair hair and tattoos on both hands and left forearm. If you know where he could be, call us now. Sussex Police would like to speak to this man in connection with a series of credit card thefts. Here he is at Lloyds Bank Littlehampton trying to obtain money with a stolen credit card. On this occasion staff became suspicious and he was unsuccessful. There have been other incidents along the Sussex coast where credit cards, cash and other valuables were stolen from sports centre lockers. The man attempting to use the stolen cards is between 30 and 35 with receding hair. He wears gold rimmed glasses and is smartly dressed. If you recognise him, please call us. If your company uses haulage contractors, you may have come across this man, Peter Ian Smith. We'd like to speak to him in connection with a series of thefts and deceptions. Over the past few months, a number of container lorries have failed to arrive at their pre-arranged destinations, and the contents were then sold on for cash. Peter Smith is 42, 6 foot, and has short, light brown hair. Although originally from Lancashire, he sometimes adopts a Birmingham accent. He's known to stay at guest houses and hotels across the country and may be using the aliases Peter Moffat and Peter Keating. If you know where he is or can help with any of our other photocall faces, please call us now. And the number to ring here is 081 811 8181. That's 081 811 8181.
More news now on the repercussions of last month's Crime Watch. First, the pet shop murder, the killing of 76-year-old Arthur Bromhill in Northampton. As a direct result of viewers' calls, four people were questioned, and the one was detained for almost the maximum period allowed by law without a charge. Inquiries there continue. And the robbery at Spencer's Wood Post Office near Reading, 60 calls, but most names have been eliminated. The best information actually came from a police officer in another area, but since inquiries are still underway, there's not a great deal more that uh, I can reveal. Sue. So. Last month, the mother of a Hertfordshire bank manager went through a terrifying ordeal. And as an indication of the seriousness of the case, there's a £25,000 reward on offer for anyone who can lead police to a conviction. On Tuesday the 2nd of March, an elderly woman was found wandering dazed along a country lane in St Albans. A week earlier, along the same lane, these three people had been taking a lunchtime stroll near their office. When the car drove past us slowly, I noticed there were two people inside. The passenger was in his late 20s, the driver was in his late 50s, and he looked quite stocky. He might have been a mechanic by what he was wearing. I think the reason why I noticed them, because they seemed a strange combination. I got the impression, as the car drove away, that there may have been a baby seat in the back. Arthur Addington has been manager at the Knapwest Bank in Hatfield for the past four years. He lives with his mother in Harpenden. Bye. Today was his first day back at work after a few days' holiday. A little later that morning, at a North London shopping centre, a car was stolen. I'm coming, I'm coming. Mrs. Addington. I shouted doing? at him and he took my glasses off and threw them on the floor somewhere. And then I tried to struggle with him, but he was much too strong and I couldn't I couldn't do anything against him. And then a car reversed up the driveway. <laughs> Your eyes closed. Andrew Lane lives next door. I've never seen that car before. I think I'll go and see if Fowler is okay. That's a good idea. Hello? Hello? I saw Valerie's glasses laying on the floor, which uh, was the first thing that worried me. There was no sign of her anywhere. The TV was on. It was so unlike Valerie to leave the door open. And because of this, it made me very worried. Hello, Mr. Addington's office. One moment, please. It's your next door neighbour and it sounds urgent. Well, I think as soon as I got the call, I realised that my mother had been kidnapped. It's something which goes with the job and which is very much in one's mind all the time. I was very obviously worried about my mother. I had no experience of anything like this, and I was just imagining how much violence would be used, whether guns would be involved, knives, how much brutality, and how she would stand up to it all. She's getting on in years, and I had no idea how long the ordeal would last. I didn't know how long I'd been in the boot. But the car stopped and one man got out Don't and came to the boot. But I kept my eyes closed because I was so terrified. I just did what they told me. It took me about half an hour to get home. And I really had no idea what I would find. All kinds of things were going through my head and I was really very worried. Yes. DC Thigston. Have you heard anything yet? No, not yet, but we hope that someone's going to contact us soon. I just had to wait then. That was the hardest part of all.
The neighbours' prompt action meant that Mr Addington was already at home by the time the kidnappers tried to contact him at the bank. Mr Addington, please. Quick. I really thought they might kill me and I would never see my two sons again or my daughter-in-law. And I really just then wanted my husband, Charles, and, and uh, my mum. Soppy day, don't I? And then um, I thought, you know, well, I'd never have a crossword with anybody, with, with my sons and that again. And also I thought, well, I'd had a good life. Good afternoon. National Westminster Bank. How can I help you? Who's in charge? Put me through to him. Hello, can I help you? What car do you drive? Why do you want to know? My car's at home. What's the registration of any car in the car park? I don't know the registration number of any of the cars in the car park. I haven't got access. A woman will be killed. Hello? Hello? But having driven around for another three quarters of an hour, the kidnappers evidently decided to admit defeat. We're letting you go now. Lie down there. Face down. <laughs> Stay there for five minutes and don't look up. There was no sound. I hadn't heard the car go away. I hadn't heard anything. I was just relieved to be alive. I'm still very angry to think that they, anybody would do it to us two who've never done any harm to anybody in their lives. Well, Mr Rayner, descriptions of the two men have actually come to you from two separate sources. First of all, from that group of office workers we saw at the beginning walking down the lane. That was the week before the abduction, when presumably the men may have been wrecking their route, perhaps in their own car. How are they described to you then? Well, the driver is described as uh, a man aged in his late 50s, stocky build, wearing dark clothing, possibly a boiler suit. The passenger is described as late 20s, early 30s, and the witness believes he's actually taller than the driver. And then the day after the abduction, somebody in Harpenton, a few miles away, saw these two men, who do look very similar. They are very similar. In fact, we're quite confident that they are the same men that were in Porter's Wood last week. So the descriptions really match? They do. In that case, do you think they could be local men? Although they were in Harpenton the day after the kidnapping, we don't think that they're local. We believe that they may have stayed in the St Albans or Harpenton area, or they may even have come back to see what police activity there was. Now, somebody watching tonight may have seen the men after they abandoned the stolen escort. Yes, they may. The, the car itself was abandoned and set on fire in Punchbowl Lane, St Albans, and this is about five miles away from where Mrs Addington was left. Now, this is a very narrow country lane, and we believe that witnesses may have seen people transferring to another vehicle or may have been held up by that vehicle travelling towards the M1 motorway, which is close by. So if you remember that, please do call us. If you know who those two men might be, please give us a ring. The number here in the studio is 081 811 8181, or you can call the police headquarters in Hertfordshire Direct, and that number is 0707 333354. That's 0707, the code for Welling Garden City, 333354. A great response so far tonight, particularly on photo call of the petrol station robber and the credit card theft. But the biggest volume of calls by far, almost uh, as soon as the item started, was on the Gene Bradley murder. We've had a large number of potential um, suspects put forward as names. They seem to come in three groups, one from the Chiswick area of West London, another from the area of Vauxhall, New Cross, South London, and another group from the south coast of England. And all sorts of ideas of who he might be, as I say, with names and addresses in some case. And we'll keep you posted on what happens soon. Well, our next case is the callous murder of Nicola and Harry Fuller at their cottage in the village of Wadhurst in Sussex. The couple had only been married six months and their families are finding it painfully hard to come to terms with the tragedy. During our reconstruction, you'll hear the actual voice of a man police are desperately trying to trace. We begin at a shopping precinct in Tunbridge Wells where Nicola had been working part-time. Oh, that's nice. Is it for someone special? Well, for my boyfriend. Would you like some ribbon? Yes, please. Nicky was a shy, private, quiet, dainty little girl, really. I hope he likes it. I'm sure he will. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Harry was just the opposite. Um, he was considerably older than her, 
Um, a very likable character, though, larger than life, but he seemed to come from a different way of life than that we were used to. Uh, he brought Nikki out of a shell, and, and she seemed to really enjoy life being with him. Right, you are then. Okay, you're a gentleman. Just leave it to me. No problem. Cheers, mate. Harry was always very protective towards Nikki. There was always a house full of flowers. They met in June and the wedding was in August. The whole thing we thought was rather, rather quick, but it was like a roller coaster once it started. There was, there was no way of stopping it. But again, they were very happy. We, we grew to like him very much. Um, he used to come here to Sunday lunch most weekends. Um, he seemed to be looking for a, a sort of a, a family unit, and he certainly became a, a very popular member of the family. Hello? OK, mate. Look, leave it to me. Unless Harry Fuller bought and sold cars. Notes. Most of his business was done on the phone. Much, I don't know. If you leave it to me, I'll try and get it down a bit. No problem at all. OK, cheers. Although he didn't read or write well, he had an eye for a good deal. A lot of his transactions were done in cash, and he often carried large amounts of money around. Lot number 201, lot number 201 coming in, the Vauxhall Cavalier, the 1600L, January of 1989... The day before he died, Harry spent the early part of the afternoon with a friend. I've known Harry for about 13 years. I asked him to get me a vehicle because having bought me one before, I knew he'd get me something reasonable. And I spent a, a couple of hours on that day with him at the auctions. Now, Harry was always buying cars and uh, looking for somewhere to store them. Um, when he uh, got the house at Wadhurst, it was like him winning the pools because he got a free car park there for all the cars he wanted to park. It was last October that Harry and Nicola had moved to Sussex and rented Blackman's Cottage in Wadhurst. It's Tuesday evening. Nicola was going out to a reunion with some friends at a restaurant in Tunbridge Wells. Okay. I'd better go and get ready. Oh, well, your friend phoned earlier on, but she's going to ring you back later. A few days right. earlier, Harry started recording his phone calls. No one knows why. This is the only caller police haven't been able to identify. How are you doing? Very well indeed. It couldn't be better. I popped over last night to see you. What time? About seven. Jim, up at the um, golf club oh. at Tysus. There were some lights on, but I knocked them. Right. See you in the morning, my darling. Hey, lady. Eight o'clock. Take care. Bye. Jump now. Harry was a late riser, and to agree to an early morning meeting was very unlike him. Oh, it's Harry. He's on time. Harry had arranged to meet Nicola at the restaurant at about 11 o'clock to bring her home. Thursday. You're going Thursday. Nicky was one of my closest friends. We'd known each other for a number of years. We used to go out together. Really yeah, I hope so. It'd be a nice break, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Harry. Oh, Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Nicky and Harry seemed very happy together. They were going on holiday to Lanzarote the following week. She was really excited about going to get some time before the summer. <laughs> Early the next morning, a postman was startled by a car pulling out from behind the Fuller's cottage. It's normally very quiet in the morning. A dirty blue Ford Escort pulled out in front of me, which caught me by surprise. The passenger seemed 35 to 40, tall and well-built, and the vehicle travelled towards Tunbridge Wells. Half an hour later, at about 7 o'clock, a witness saw two men get out of a cream-coloured Sierra and walk up the path to the cottage. The witness who saw these men gave the information anonymously. Police need him to contact them again. Hello, old son. Nobody saw the two men leave, but we know that Harry went out of the cottage about an hour and a half later, leaving the door ajar. Good morning, can I help you? 20 Embassy number one, please. Thank you. 
226. Thank you. That's ten pounds. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Nikki had gone to a reunion on Tuesday night and I hadn't spoken or seen her since Sunday. So I decided to ring her at 8, 9, 8.45. And I rang and the line was engaged and I continued to ring every five minutes until quarter past nine. Nicola and Harry Fuller had been shot dead just ten minutes after Harry's visit to the tobacconist. You know, she just seems to have found happiness and then suddenly snatched away from her, which seems dreadful. Absolutely dreadful. Anyone could do that to her. I feel that this part of me has gone and there is this big hole that's never going to be filled. And I do miss her, so. Well, of course, it's going to be absolutely crucial, isn't it, Superintendent Hill, to discover who that unidentified caller is. We can listen to that call again. Our engineers have taken Harry's voice out of the tape you're about to hear, so that the only voice on the tape is the caller's voice. Do you know who this is? How are you doing? Can we take first thing? Too early, boys. About eight. I popped over last night to see you. There were some lights on. He's gone away. He's left them with his missus. So we'll zip down there. Won't be long. About, what, 10, 15 minutes? They're down the other side of Roberts Bridge. So that's just the caller's side of the conversation. And that meeting was arranged very close to the time that Nicola and Harry were killed. So until this man comes forward, he's got to be your prime suspect. It's absolutely crucial we find this man. Um, so far, we haven't found him and he hasn't come forward. There may be some reason for that. Um, but we really need to find him. And uh, I would ask anybody who's listening tonight who either recognises his voice or who thinks they recognise his voice to please make contact with us. Alternatively, if the man concerned is listening and he himself uh, wants to contact us to, for us to eliminate him then please contact us. Do you think he might be called Steve or? Well there's an indication that he might be called Steve however I would want uh, anybody who might recognize the voice irrespective of whether the person is called Steve or not to contact us. Now you want the witness who saw the men in the cream sierra to come forward again but you have another witness who saw another car and a man early that morning. That's correct just after eight o'clock that morning in the car park at the rear of Blackman's cottage uh, a lady saw a long black bonneted vehicle, something like a Jaguar, uh, pull up and a man get out of the vehicle and he was fairly distinctive in that he was wearing a very long black coat, almost to the ground. Um, we would like anybody else who saw that man or indeed saw the vehicle to make contact with us. And if you know who that voice was on the phone call, if you can shed any light at all on this case, please do call us. There's a substantial reward for information leading to arrest and charge. The number here in the studio is 0818118181. Our lines here are very busy, as they were last month, so do take a special note of the incident room number at Sussex Police Headquarters, and that's 0273 480 999. That's 0273, the code for Lewis, 480 999. Now to Incident Desk, our notice board that helps local police appeals reach right across the country. Here again are David Hatcher and Jackie Haynes. Just after 10.30pm on Thursday the 18th of February, a 26-year-old woman was raped near the busy Holloway Road in North London. We need to identify her attacker and trace anyone who was in the area at the time. Earlier that evening, the victim had met an old work colleague who invited her to go for a drink in the Hercules pub on the Holloway Road. She left about 10.30pm and asked two passers-by directions to Finsbury Park Station on the Seven Sisters Road. She describes these men as Turkish or Greek, and we'd like to speak to them as they may unknowingly have seen her attacker. Minutes later, as she was walking along Holloway Road, she was grabbed, dragged across the pavement into an alleyway and raped. Her attacker's about 30, 5 foot 10 and of medium build with short fair hair. His teeth are grey and uneven and he was wearing an earring in his left ear. If you can help in any way or if you recognise this man, please call the officers at Holloway Police Station on 071 263 9090. That's 071 263 9090. If you can piece together a series of clues, including this jacket, 
you could help solve an armed robbery in Stratford-upon-Avon two months ago. Just before closing time on Thursday the 4th of February, two robbers went into Jean Bateman's antique jewellery shop in the town centre and threatened the manager with a knife. They grabbed over £50,000 worth of jewellery from the displays. These items are similar to the pieces that were taken, which were all antique and very distinctive. The men escaped in a Green Rover Metro, which was waiting outside. The car had been stolen two weeks earlier from Edgbaston, Birmingham. It was found abandoned a quarter of a mile away in the old town. Inside, officers found this jacket, baseball cap and glasses. Perhaps they belonged to one of the robbers. The first man's about 30, 5 foot 8 and stocky with very fair hair. His accomplice was younger, in his 20s, 5 foot 11, slim, with dark hair. If you recognise the description of either man or can help in any way, please call the CID at Stratford-upon-Avon on 0789 414111. That's 0789, the code for Stratford-upon-Avon, 414111. And here's the number here in the studio again, 081 811 8181. 081 811 8181. Although we feel we have to, we have to, we're always reluctant to show violent crimes committed by intruders in people's homes. For one thing, they're intensely disturbing. For another, they're extremely rare. In fact, our next case is so unusual, it's bizarre. This is Cowden Beath in Fife. We uh, had seen the place advertised and uh, put in a bid and successfully uh, got the house. We didn't move in until about September, early September. We planned for about six months before the move-in date, all the things we would do to it, and it was like our dream home. The clock had been given as a Christmas gift one year after we'd been married from our daughter Linda and our son-in-law Jim. So it was a prized possession that it stood in pride of place on the mantelpiece below June's portrait. Just round the corner from the Mathis home is an industrial estate. Who's in charge here? I'm in charge. Oh, well. We've been doing some tarmacking down the road and uh, we got some left over. And uh, we noticed you got some potholes here that need filling. I mean, we'd be wondering, would you like us to do it for you? So, what money are you for that? 15 quid. Right, okay. The full squad struck me definitely as uh, us traveling people, more from the gypsy side. Had uh, an English accent and it said he'd been working down in the Manchester area. Right, that's about the size of it then. That's £1,650, please. The boy told me it was going to be £15. Pounds. Yeah, 15 quid a square metre. Oh, I can't afford that. Hey, 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 hang on, you can afford it. You've got a thriving business here. So if you want your business to thrive some more, you'll pay up, OK? What do you mean by that? Listen, I'll tell you what I mean by that. I'm getting my bloody money's worth out of this place one way or another, so you better pay up, mate, OK? At that point, I took that to mean that he was going to smash the place up over me. So we paid the money and away we went. But it was just more or less to get them off the yard. One week later, on a Friday afternoon, June Mathis was finishing work at her pub about five minutes from her house. Nice me getting off now, Linda. I'll see, see you later. tonight. Cheerio. Oh, yeah. She would have been at her home when this man was driving down her street. From the Perth Road, I pulled into Lucas Beef Drive at about uh, 4.45, heading up towards my house, and I noticed a white van parked on the corner of Glenfield Drive. It was half on, half off the path, which was a bit weird. Guy Mathis works in the oil industry and was looking forward to the weekend off. When I left work that evening, a lot of work had been done to the house, so um, the tiler had been in to finish tiling the kitchen, which was one of the very last things that was being done to the house, so it had just about reached the uh, completion stage, and I was thinking, God, when I get home, I'll have a look at the tiles, and that'll be virtually us, finished and completed our dream home. It was about quarter past six on a Friday evening. I was driving down Glenfield Road. When I turned the corner, I saw someone standing on the pavement. When I glanced, I saw it was a, a man standing 
uh, standing still for no apparent reason. I thought it was strange. It was dark and there wasn't any bus stop nearby. Hello, June. Mom. Safe. There's no safe. I kept on about two safes, and I says there's definitely no safes in the house. Well, I know June and Guy Mathis quite well after doing work in the house, and I just so happened that I was passing what I seen a red escort which had been reversed into the driveway. It was a Jai or a key race. I don't know any part of the family that's got a car like that. Don't look! Don't look! June and Guy's ordeal was to last an hour, and we only hint at the violence that was used. But June kept her head and made a oh. mental note of details, oh. like the breach of one of the three guns. Down. Come on up. It had sort of a brass yeah. fancy bit on the top. Around seven o'clock, at the corner, I noticed the white transit in June's drive. I thought this was a bit funny because it's not the sort of van you would see in June's drive. I've had enough of you too. Right, get back. See you in a minute. Yes, hello? Is that the police? What was stolen was chiefly of sentimental value. Some jewellery, for instance, which had belonged to June's sister, who died the year before. We had her jewellery, and her jewellery was to go to the grandchildren. You know, I could always look at it and say, well, this was June. Mm. So it's things that... Uh, That's all you had to remember her by. Mm. People that comes into homes with guns should be stopped. I don't know, it just shouldn't be. One of the thoughts that crossed my mind during the thing was, what if our daughter or son came with the grandchildren while all this was happening? What would have happened then to those people? Would they have been snatched, the grandchildren? And that's a frightening thought. Ian Beattie, obviously the first thing you want to do is eliminate these three tarmacers who were there the week before. Yes, that's correct. What can you tell us about them? We have a description yes. of the three men. The first man, he was 20 years of age, five foot eight tall, fair hair and he was heavy build. The second man was mid to late 30s, six foot tall, black hair, stout build and he had a short moustache and beard. The third man was mid 30s, five foot ten inches tall, blonde hair and was medium build. Okay, they all had uh, North of England accents, I gather, and of course they may or may not be connected with the robbery. You need to find out who they were. They did have a Ford Transit van, a white Ford Transit. We know that a white Ford Transit and a, a red Ford Escort were involved in, in the robbery. There was no safe at that house, though, ever, was there? No, there's never, ever been a safe in that house. Tough information. What they took was of tremendous sentimental value. Uh, this is a, a reproduction of the Ormolu clock that was stolen. Tell us about the watches. Is there anything distinct yes. about them? Raymond Veal watches, a ladies and gents watch, and these are exactly replicas of the watches that were stolen from the house. Well, if anybody uh, offers you watches like those, or this sort of reproduction, or milieu clock, please call the police. If you know anything about this or recognise any of those three men, the number here in the studio is 081 811 or you can contact the Fife Incident Room direct the number there is 0592 52611. That's 0592, the code for Kirkcaldy, 52611. Well, I've seen that we've got quite a few calls coming in, more than 60 calls on the murder of Jean Bradley, suggesting names for the attacker, and there have been suggestions about the bag and about the hat. Um, on photo call, two of the cases have been very good on that. Police are actively following up two of them, in fact. Um, there have been names suggested on the Hertfordshire abduction case and on incident desk there have been names suggested for the man who carried out the rape in Holloway Road in North London. So it's all happening at the moment. The lines are very busy. If, uh, if there's anything, in fact, you can add on any of our cases tonight, 
You can ring us still, although, as I said, the lines are busy on 081 8181. And they're going to be open until a quarter past midnight tonight. Detectives are going to be acting on your information as it comes in, and we hope to have more news when we come back with Crime Watch Update. That'll be in an hour and a half's time, rather later than usual, I'm afraid, at 11.45. And if you can't stay up till then, who on earth could blame you? Bear in mind that very few crimes are as bad as those that we ask your help with. People's risk of suffering violence is, uh, for example, a great deal less than the risk of injury through accidents. So, despite the images we've shown tonight, please do keep things in perspective and don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. What's real life like in Australia, away from the soap operas? Well, next week, a new series gets underway from Sylvania Waters, a fly-on-the-wall documentary about the Baker-Donoghue family. That's next Thursday at 9.35. Casualties back to the days when new staff had reputations to ruin. Oh, no, it's been a picnic. Oh, not exactly Florence Nightingale, but she's keen. Well done, Doctor. You've been here less than a week. You've nearly succeeded in killing one of your first patients. At 9.35.